from your local election headquarters. This is Politics Today with Jackie Kingston. People who registered to vote didn't all actually vote. Coming up, we're taking a look at voter turnout versus voter registrations here on the High Plains. And the race for Texas governor is decided. We'll hear from Governor Greg Abbott, who's setting his agenda for his third term. It was election week, and we're recapping some of the biggest races on this show this morning here on Politics Today. Thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. There were a record number of new registered voters in the Amarillo area going into the midterm elections. However, voter turnout was still lower than expected. Voter turnout in both counties was lower in the 2018 midterm elections. Politics Today's Maya Clark starts our show today with that story. Combined, Potter and Reno County reported around 69,000 voters in the 2022 midterm election. In Potter County, 37% of registered voters participated, while Reno County had 50.06% of registered voters participate. Ended up with uh, over 21,000 that voted altogether. Roughly 60% of them voted early and 40% of them voted on election day. So yesterday we had well over 8,000 that came in to vote. In 2018, Potter County had over 53,000 registered voters and a 46% voter turnout rate. This year, less than half registered voters actually voted. We were actually down from then. Um, that our numbers were less than we had in 2018. Around 30% of the people did vote. And um, that leaves 70% that didn't. <laughs> so, yes, you know, the number of people registered compared to the number of people voted is totally different. Reno County had over 85,000 registered voters in 2018, and in 2022, there are 95,908 registered voters, according to the Texas Secretary of State. With a drastic increase in the number of registered voters, it is having a significant impact on voter turnout numbers. There's always a gap. Since 2018, voter turnout declined by more than 5% in Randall County and by 9% in Potter County. Huntley says final numbers will be reported this week as provisional ballots and PCA ballots are counted. In Potter County, unofficial results show 37.48% of registered voters turned out in this election. 12,234 people voted early, 1,313 voted absentee in this election, and nearly 8,300 voted on election day. Now we turn to the race for Texas governor. Republican incumbent Greg Abbott faced Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. Both made stops here on the High Plains during their campaigns, picking up supporters and campaign funds. However, Governor Abbott was the winner of that race with 55% of the vote. Our Texas correspondent, Monica Madden, was at the watch party for Governor Abbott on Tuesday. Here she is with the latest. We're in McAllen where Governor Greg Abbott had his watch party and gave his victory speech as he heads into his third term as Texas governor. Now, he chose this location for a very specific reason. We're miles away from the Texas-Mexico border, and as we all know, that has been one of his key campaign messages, promising to keep up efforts that he thinks will secure the border and help address immigration issues. He also talked about South Texas being a Democratic stronghold that Republicans have spent time and money on. Take a listen to what he had to say. We started this campaign in South Texas. We celebrated my primary victory in South Texas. Tonight, we return to South Texas to celebrate my reelection. We planted our flag in South Texas, and we showed America that South Texas is now electing Republicans to office in our great state. Now on Monday morning at 9 a.m., the governor is going to have a post-election roundtable here in McAllen as well. We don't know the details of what he's going to be talking about yet, but I can guess that it'll be about his victory and what his legislative priorities are as we're just months away from that legislative session in McAllen. Monica Madden, back to you. Monica, thank you. Looking now at other Texas races, Texas Lieutenant Governor, Republican incumbent Dan Patrick faced Democrat Mike Collier. Patrick winning that race with 54% of the vote. Moving now to the race for Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton was facing Rochelle Garza. Paxton won that race with 53% of the vote. Texas Representative for District 13 also on the ballot Tuesday night. Ronnie Jackson won that race as he earned 75% of that vote. Jackson was facing off against opponent Kathleen Brown. Representative Jackson says he plans to focus on three areas after winning re-election, agriculture, defense, and health care. 
This is the number one ag district in the state of Texas, number five in the country. I'm going to be on ag in January, so I'm going to be involved in a lot of ag issues. We have the farm bill coming up in 2023. It's going to be a really big year for ag all over the country, especially here in Texas. I'm going to be a big part of that. And then lastly, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, so I'm going to be really involved in anything and everything involving defense and national security. And with the focus being on Pantex, Bell Helicopter, and Shepard Air Force Base. Representative Jackson is currently on the doctor's caucus and says he'll also be focusing on several health care reform issues. Now to the rate for way, race for state representative District 87. Republican for Price with a solid win over challenger Nick Hearn, taking 87% of the vote in that race. Representative Price won his seventh term in the Texas House. A few of his legislative measures in past terms include increasing access to telehealth and telemedicine across the state, providing mental health resources and education in public schools, improving the nexus between mental health and criminal justice system, and strengthening laws against synthetic drugs. I will continue the hard work to represent the panhandle, uh, especially in areas that make a difference to our region, rural health care, uh, water resource development, uh, the protection of our energy and agricultural uh, business industries, economic development, and uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do that. Our friends in New Mexico and Oklahoma also had gubernatorial races on the ballot last week, starting with the governor's race in New Mexico, incumbent Michelle Lujan Grisham being defeated uh, as challenger uh, Mark, uh, defeating rather, challenger Mark Ronchetti, winning 52% of the vote. Again, Lujan Grisham was reelected. In the race for Oklahoma's governor, Republican Kevin Stitt won with 55% of the vote against challenger Joy Hoffmeister. Much more coming up, including a really interesting discussion on differentiating between fake news. But as we go to break, more election results. Welcome back. Let's now turn our attention to Potter County. Or first, we'll start, we'll start over in Hereford in the school district's referendum there. Voters were deciding whether they wanted their taxes to increase. On the ballot, a three cent increase to the district's maintenance and operation tax rate. The referendum actually failed with 57% of the vote. The money would have been used to generate revenue for teacher and staff pay and to add new positions. Another school district proposition in Canadian will be a decrease of 8.2% over last year's maintenance and operation tax rate. However, it will provide a revenue increase of 32.6%. As you can see, voters approved that proposition by 63% of the race. We have more results from these races and other races across our area on our website, myhighclaims.com. We're seeing more and more fake news being created, and honestly, it could dupe anyone. Coming up, we're speaking with two librarians from West Texas A&M University who've developed new strategies to identify it. Online. That's the question WT librarians Kelly Hoppy and Mark McKnight tried to answer in their recent TLA presentation. I had the opportunity to sit down with them last week to discuss their work and hear their advice. Mark and Kelly joining us now in studio to talk more about this important topic. Y'all, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, sifting through false news and legitimate news is something that we all have to deal with now in this day and age. My first question about that is, why does it exist at all? The supply and demand portion of, of fake news, why does this exist and, and why are we drawn to it? Mark, that question to you first. Well, I think that uh, primarily it exists because um, because there's a market for it, because it feeds into our bias. Um, we've all got to recognize that we each have our own biases with regards to you know, the information we'd like to see, and um, the fake news sort of feeds into that. So, Kelly, you agree? I do agree. I think that also, you know, we're just looking for things that are interesting, and those things are usually things that we have a bias toward and so we just sort of latch on to those things. The algorithm is feeding us the things that it knows that we respond to, right? That's so we're, exactly so we're right. able to, to click on that. So when we click on something that's interesting, uh, what are the guidelines that y'all recommend and seeing, you know, what, and, and how have you improved on those guidelines with your, with your research? 
Well, one thing is when you come across something that does not have any citations or any facts to back it up, that's a signal to you that it could be fake news and that you need to do a little more research. There's something called lateral reading that uh, Mark could explain because it's a very helpful tool when you are looking to authenticate whether or not something is true. Um, so essentially lateral reading is when you're doing any sort of research or looking at anything like this online, you just open up a secondary tab and take a look at uh, a few key pieces of information about a given article that you're looking at. So you might want to look up the author and see, you know, how many years have they been um, writing about this or studying this. And you might want to take a look at the um, uh, where this stuff is being published, um, just to kind of see, you know, where what is their reasoning for publishing this kind of stuff. Um, so that's what lateral reading is, just moving laterally, um, opening up a secondary tab and, and taking a look at this information. Why are we predisposed maybe, why are we prone to not do that at, in the first place? Uh, knowing what we do about uh, advertising and fake news and all of the content that is on the internet, what do you think, uh, why do you think it takes us that second moment to think, I should check on this before I just believe it? I think a big thing is that it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of effort. It's much easier to just believe the thing that you've read and to share it without thinking any further. It's much more difficult and more time consuming to do the research to find out whether or not that is true. To do the critical thinking of, exactly of, right. <laughs> of the actual information that that's you're being exactly given. Right. Why do you think that's more, or why do you, do you think that that is incredibly important or more important during an election season especially? Um, do you think that it, that this sort of research and this sort of critical thinking and lateral reading um, is really important when you're reading things that have to do with midterm elections, national elections, all, all of it? Well, I think it's just because we're, we're inundated with so much information about each one of the different candidates and, and it's really difficult to see uh, just on its face whether or not it's real or not. So, you know, you've got to make the mental note to actually take that extra step and think critically about it. And each side is saying the things to make their candidate look good. They're not going to say anything to make their candidate look bad. And so if you really want to be well informed, you have to look at all sides. You have to step away from your favorite candidate and look at the other side to see if what is being said is true. So we've talked a little bit about what makes um, fake news maybe unreliable. If the author hasn't written anything or hasn't written a lot of things, what they, where, who pays them, right? Where their money, where their funding comes from. Well, what makes a news source reliable? What's the other side of that? If they have um, a well-established track record, if they have reputable reporters who have maybe published and they can back up all of their information with facts, you can tell that they've done their research because they have citations for things. They aren't making outrageous claims without facts to back them up. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I, no, I think that pretty much covers it. You're just you're looking to make sure that they've got a lot of references and, and a lot of citations in order to back up the information that they're giving you. Uh, that's I think that's the biggest th thing to look for. One of the things that I always tell my students um, at WT when we're talking about fake news is that I think it's also maybe important, and y'all please push back uh, on this, but I think it might be important to make sure that the people who are writing the information have have a track record of getting things right, but admitting when they're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and having that, that, um, that building their credibility in those ways of being accountable to the facts, right. um, to what those things are. Right, so you you talk, you're talking about um, making sure that their credibility is good. We call that um, in the library world uh, authority. Hmm. Um, and so having a track record where you not only are right a decent amount of time, but you also admit when you're wrong is building that authority. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we want you to look for authors who have a, a good authority to actually, you know, um, write about or talk about what it is that they're, that they're uh, writing on. I think that could also make people feel more comfortable to maybe say, okay, I thought this was true, but I realize it's not, and mm -hmm. I've seen this professional person say they made a mistake, you know, and I think that could help people just in general have buy-in to give themselves the freedom 
you know, yeah. to say, oh, I've made a mistake, that's not right, and I did some research and I found out. That, that there is actually another side to this right. that maybe they weren't considering. Exactly. Mark and Kelly, thanks for your work on this. Thanks for coming in and talking with us about it. I appreciate you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Next, the city of Amarillo is responding to a lawsuit they lost over how to fund the Civic Center. Here, what they say is the next step in the case. The City of Amarillo has filed a Notice of Accelerated Appeal in the Civic Center funding lawsuit. The Notice of Appeal was filed in Potter County District Court Thursday morning, weeks after a judge ruled in Amarillo businessman Alex Fairley's favor. Now the city says it needs clarity in that case. Politics Today's Kaylee Green has the latest. This Notice of Appeal comes after Judge William Souter ruled on October 25th against the City of Amarillo in every aspect of the Civic Center lawsuit. The City can no longer move forward with the project the way the Council approved funding for back in May, but they say there's more at stake here. I think it's less about the Civic Center project. Clearly, the window has closed for us to do that, um, and now the appeal is really about getting clarification on how a City goes through the process to follow state law to issue debt. Mayor Ginger Nelson says the city has used the anticipation note tool before to issue debt. She says they followed a checklist they have used for years, the same process the Texas Attorney General approved in the past. But she says Judge Souter's ruling indicates the process might not have been what the city should have followed and it conflicts with state law. We have a responsibility to follow the appeals process to get more clarification on how would a city issue debt? How would a city um, draft an agenda item on a debt issuance? How would they put an ordinance out that's being negotiated right up until the minute of council meeting? How would you define public use? All of these things are questions that cities going forward have to know and understand in order to continue operating. The city of Amarillo can withdraw the notice of appeal if the judge rules differently in the city's motion to modify, which was filed on Friday. That hearing is scheduled for November 21st. We'll follow that for you here. Mayor Nelson says she hopes people will continue to host events at the Civic Center despite these ongoing challenges. Digital reporter David Gay has much more about how the lawsuit has impacted the overall Civic Center project. Check at myhighplains.com. The Amarillo Local Government Corporation is dis discussing the future of downtown parking. The city says the parking garage it owns is being used more. We're told they're considering several options to make the garage more profitable, from utilizing technology to new marketing techniques, even selling some of the facility. This is important because it allows us to keep more revenue to pay down the note on the parking garage at a faster rate. No, at this point, there's no plans for the parking garage to be sold. Danforth says lowering the lease on the re retail space below the garage was also discussed. Fi finding a GPS model specifically for alleys, the latest strategy from city leaders as they work to solve the city's trash pickup problem. The city's director of public works, Donnie Hooper, tells us it'll soon begin a pilot program using cameras and GPS technology to mark trash carts and alleys in need of that service. Just finding the right model for what we do in Amarillo has been difficult. It's challenging because a lot of cities across America do not use alleys for trash collection. Here in Amarillo and in the Texas Panhandle, we do. You have to find a solution that will GPS you to an alley location. Hooper says the program will be implemented in the next couple of weeks. The City of Amarillo's mural grant program has begun. The city says the program is open to businesses and nonprofits in the four quadrants of the city and in the Central Business District. Grants can be matched up to $5,000. The application deadline is coming up soon, January 31st. We'll wrap things up here on Politics Today, right after this.
Well, thanks for being here this week on Politics Today, and thanks to those of you who tuned into our special edition of Politics Today on election night. We always love bringing you as much coverage as we can, and we appreciate you being here every time. Don't forget that you can follow along with us on social media. I'm on Facebook. You can find me there. Also on Twitter, Jackie Kingston plus the number one on that website for now. You can also follow along with us and stay up with all the latest political news throughout the week on our website, My High Plains. Dot com, where we have continuing coverage of all of our stories that we brought you today. Thanks again for being here. We'll see you soon.